Hello. It's me again. I'm sorry you might be wondering what I'm doing standing in front of you like this. It's all part of the story I want to tell you. I want to tell you about how I began to think about things that, that I'd never touched before. How, how it came that one day I went, I went into my dressing room, my walk-in cupboard really it is, and I happened to glance towards the mirror and I, I, I took the, the fog, the cobwebs off it and had a good look to all that rust and, and I saw me. What a terrible thing to behold. I was so shocked and I, I, I didn't even have these wonderful African underpants on. So can you imagine, just for a moment, I ask you to imagine what it would be like without these things on. So I've been puzzling and I, I, I've, been, I've been wondering why we who are God's chosen example of his art, why we should look so ugly, so boring, so uninteresting. Why? I've come up with this. I think I have a, I think I have a way of dealing with this. I think what happened it was in the days of the paradise. You remember between the Euphrates and the Tigris there was this wonderful little spot where God invented farming and and he grew all these wonderful things and I believe it was there was just fruits dripping from the trees and everything was more beautiful than the next thing. And at the top of the ladder, after he'd done everything else, he made man and woman of the greatest beauty of all. And that, that's, that's when it started. Because then I remembered there was this story with the apple, this terrible, terrible thing that happened to the apple. Do you remember it? Eve was seduced by the snake. She bit into that. She didn't, wasn't even allowed to finish it. She bit into the apple. And when God saw that and he told her, he told her not to eat that apple. She threw it away quickly. Please, please forgive me, but when God is angry, those of you who have read the Old Testament will know, when God is angry, he he, he sends pandemics. <coughs> he gets disruptive. He punishes people. So what happened there after? God grabbed Adam and Eve and he, he all the most beautiful decorations that they had, this these lovely, lovely feathers coming out of their head. He ripped them off and, 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 and there's a huge hole here. You can still sometimes feel it when a child wraps up with blood pouring out. And, and then, then he went to the tail. Of course, they had this amazing tail right out there. And it was, it, it, he, he ripped that off and you can, he, even there you can still and it was the most beautiful tale in the whole of paradise. And then, but the last and final thing, the, the final thing that he did, which destroyed everything, he pulled the skin right off, he peeled it off those people, Adam and Eve, including the wings that were attached to that thing. And you can still see the good guys are still up in the sky. 
And what's more, he jumped on it. Absolutely jumped. He, he, he was so angry and he kicked them out of paradise. And when they stood outside after they'd walked through the Tigris and they looked at each other, and they, they hadn't been to Woolworths and didn't know anything about that, but they looked like I did, like plucked chickens. Boiled, plucked chickens. Terrible. And here's what I'm, why I'm telling you the story, because when they looked at each other, when Adam stood there and Eve stood there and he quickly gave her something, a fig leaf to cover her puffy bits, and, 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 and she gave him a banana leaf to do the same thing. Uh, and then, ever since that day, they've been striving to look beautiful again. In God's honor, they want to go back to what they looked like when they were young. So I now will attempt the same thing that they were attempting. I'll make myself beautiful again. So you don't have to look at me. Put this wonderful shirt, the colors of Mandela, on again. Because he was the most beautiful person that you can imagine. Button it up so that you don't you see if you see how horrible it was. Oh, I don't look at that mirror again. I, I, I don't. I'm, I'm, until I'm ready. When I'm ready, have a look at the mirror again. But in the meantime, so this is basically. And now I want to show you what Rakosa men did to correct those mistakes. Well, they couldn't get wings or anything like that, although some of them do because nowadays we can fly again, but we still haven't got it right to actually have wings. And look at that. Here is the example of absolute beauty. You can see, I don't think even, even God in his best moments would have thought of making something as beautiful as this. This is the man, the man going out with his girlfriend by his side or his wife by his side. They're going out to some festival somewhere and he has been working his butt off in the mines and wherever it was to get the money together. Doesn't mind the suffering that went along with it to make himself glorious and beautiful. And he and his woman dress the same. They want to be together. They want to be seen as a pair, as one thing. Isn't that beautiful? Those are Cosa. Similo is one. Were you still waiting for him to dress up beautifully like that? Now I want to talk to you about something else because Everything we do in our museum is about storytelling. We don't make people bend down and look at something or other and read some story. We do the original art, the original way that news was spread, that time went on. That's what we try to do at the museum. And every one, the exciting thing about it is that you get people like me who were born in another continent, this and that, and, and, and have a completely different background. You get people like me telling you the stories that I invent when I look at all this wonderful work around me. Pumzila will tell you other stories. She will tell you the stories of when she was part of it. When she, who comes from the royal family of Swaziland and who migrated into Freyheit area, which is a farming area, and lived still with the ancestors, still with those who remembered. And she will tell you how it changed when she moved into the city, when suddenly things that were perfectly normal at the farm, like 
little girls running around and little boys running around undressed until they were about seven years old. That was how it was. And she got to the city and they were laughed at and belittled as being rural and, and uneducated and that sort of thing. It's wonderful and everybody, poor, everybody will tell you different stories. So that's why, that's really why we're doing this thing and why in our museum we call it a feel-good museum. You come to us and you walk through and you are just amazed by this art. And you come out and you feel good about those roots that you had because it's some of your ancestors who did that. And I, I come out because my ancestors if I go really back, because most of the world have lost it, my ancestors used to do similar things to these. And I, for me, it, the excitement is in comparing how different people in different places all kind of wanted to say the same thing. The first thing was how to look beautiful. But now I want to talk, tell you my story about medicine. And what, uh, as an example of the power of medicine, I want to go up north to the Tsonga Shangan people, who are really the top of the pile in terms of medicine, in terms of conversing with the ancestors, and especially in terms of what I want to talk to you about is about the beauty of it all. So here, you remember those stampers? People, the old Bantu people, the ones who first came down to the south, they used wooden stampers, they were farmers. Singunis who came later on, who were the herders, who brought the cattle in. So here's a there's a stamper, and here is the, the, uh, the base of it. But instead of a stamper coming out of it, it becomes a tree. It is growing. So the food that's being stamped here is feeding this new tree, and it's the tree of healing. Isn't that amazing? And you know how you heal? You heal through beauty. You heal through beauty and caring. And if you look here, if you look at, you want to just about hug this thing. It is so brilliant. It is so wonderful. Look at these designs. Look at these wonderful little flowers and things that are on here. Isn't it? Absolutely amazing. So, you know, when you see that and you know that there's medicine in there, you realize that that person cares. That person loves you. That person really, really will heal because their bodies will react to this wish that we have to feel better. And remember, most of our healing happens in our brains, because our body does the healing. So we've done everything we can here. This is the Sangoma's pot. But now, there's some healing that needs to be done not just by the ancestors, because here the ancestors are in control. Some healing has to be done by calling all of nature, by calling those powers by God to help you. And then you borrow from nature and you say, this illness has to be driven away. A huge natural but all of nature will come to fight this terrible thing that's happening over there. 
but it still needs to be beautiful. Because that animal that gave its horn for this, the mooty inside there, has to be respected. So look at this. Isn't it wonderful? Under normal traditions, you are not supposed to ever represent the face or give something life. That's why everything is always ge geometry. Wherever you look, everything is geometric. But the Sangomas are allowed to break that rule. So there you'll always see a carved head or something. And this is the guy who looks after that amazing stuff that's inside there. This is a Sangoma. And when she has her classes, when she's training others, other Sangoma, uh, young people who have had the calling to become a Sangoma, this forms a centerpiece of her training space. See her eyes. They're looking into nature, they're looking into space, they're not looking at us. They are already in a dream. See the amazing beadwork. Again, great beauty is being manufactured here. And there you see a beautiful thing, which is, you can see there, they are safety pins. And you know, the beauty of a safety pin was that it, it, in itself, just as an element, it is a wonderful thing and it shines and does all sorts of things. But if you look at it carefully and you know a little bit about history and you know a little bit how people behaved at the time, you will find that women, when they went out by themselves and they were scared of being attacked or confronted or something or other, they do the same thing that a thorn tree does when it doesn't want to be eaten with a, with a, by a goat. They put thorns in their clothing. So the safety pin is the opposite of a thorn in your jacket. The safety pin is closed. So it's a sign of friendship. It's a sign of wanting other people, being nice to people, and them being nice to you. Isn't that a wonderful way of interpreting that whole story? Now I want to come to a very, very interesting part of the whole thing, of my stories for today, and that is sleep. And you know, this is a very straightforward one. It's not one of those beautiful one headrests that are given during marriage or that sort of thing, but it is a one that's well slept. It has that beautiful feeling on it, and you sit on it during the day. And you know what happens here? When you put your head on it, and apparently, I didn't know that, but the blood flow gets slightly affected so that you, your dreams are much more expressive. And when you dream, they are just like the Jungians. And the Jungians come here everywhere to find out about some Gormas dreams and how they relate to Jung. The whole world has conferences here trying to find out more about dreams. And these headrests are not unusual. You will see them all over Africa, you will see, find them in the pyramids, you will find them in Japan still, in China still, lots of people are still sleeping on these sort of objects. And I've tried it, I mean, often when you go camping you find a stone and you, find, you put your shirt on the stone to, and, and you sleep, it's fine. People often wonder why is it, you know, and, and, and well, it's the way people used to sleep. You don't want things to creep in your ears the whole time and, and, and you know all the other orifices are closed but these ones are open. Now lastly I want to talk 
about the moon again. Remember the moon? This wonderful thing I showed you before. It's amazing circular thing made by a fantastic artist who works with uh, potato chip bags. Isn't that wonderful? It's about the moon. And you know the moon? The moon is what introduces the night. The moon is about sleeping. It's about rest. It's about that mystical world that you enter in at night while the sun makes things grow but it can kill you and it can be very, very, very hard on you. But at the same time, it's a thing that feeds you. The Bushmen worship the moon. So you see what the ladies wore. All these interpretations of the moon. Or are they ostrich eggs? What are these wonderful circles that they see everywhere, that everything is about? And look, there's no trimming or order in this, in this work. It is basically, it is an animal that's made into, that camouflages you and links you with nature. That's in contrast to the Bantu people who wanted to stand apart with nature, who had order in everything. Look at these exquisite things. These little bags one wore around one's neck, and on the side. You see the wonderful interpretations of the moon again? The moon and fertility go together. Here's another. See the subtle difference? Everybody still wants to be, wants to use their own creative fluids and make it a little bit different. And here we've added some bean or other that will obviously bring us luck. I have another one. Look at that. Look at the beautiful circles down here represented by shells. Wonderful. So you must have gone all the way to the sea to collect these shells. They are very, very precious altogether. I want to just show you about what you dream about. You dream about rain. Because rain is the thing that makes things grow. Without rain, there will be no hunting. And you're a hunter-gatherer. You're going out there and you're finding the food under the ground or galloping above the ground. So everywhere you looked, when you looked in the clouds, you saw this sacred cow, this rich animal, this, in fact, it was not even a cow at that stage. It was an eland. There was an eland floating in the, in the sky that produced the rain in your country. So on your, in this marvelous work here, it represents the Ngunis. And the Ngunis were partially mixed with the, the San people when they arrived in this country, also selected it as the bringer of life and the bringer of rain. So it's very entrenched in that function. To finish off with, this is what you hunted with. You were even, I suppose, it, it, life was about doing as little damage as possible, what you can get so you could eat, 
So this, they had bows and arrows, something that the Bantu people did not have, so they invented shooting. And here are the arrows. Here are the arrows. Beautifully made with gut, gut from an animal or a hare, but poisoned so that the animal would soon die and you could feed on it. And everything was eaten of the animal, everything. These remind me, by the way, of cupids, you know, maybe cupids in a way. were also a little hunter-gatherers originally. Here's the, here's how you shoot it. Isn't that wonderful? So thank you very much. It's been a fantastic talk. I learn a lot too because I need to do research and I need to do this and to give you these opinions that I have. But next time, we're going to talk about culture. Thank you.